Good morning, Abundant Life. <laughs> Y'all can stand and worship with us this morning. We're going to get started. We're going to give God praise and honor and glory for everything that he is due. scripture hallelujah coming from the book of acts chapter 1 verses 8 and it says but you shall receive power when the holy spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in jerusalem and in judea and in samaria and to the ends of the earth hallelujah now when he has spoken these things while they watch he was taken up and the cloud received him out of their sight hallelujah 
Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm gonna I'm gonna sing the whole about the Holy Spirit today. Do y'all know how important the Holy Spirit it is when we received the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? We it came with the whole package. The Godhead, the Godhead, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And it is so important that we have the Holy Spirit within us. It is within us. You can talk to the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. He leads us. He guides us into all truth. He helps us when we go out there and we witness, hallelujah, to the, to the, the unbeliever. He helps us in things. He brings things back to our remembrance. Hallelujah. It is so important to have the Spirit of God with within us and to allow him to steer us and to guide us and to lead us out here. We need him. We need the Holy Ghost. We need the Holy Spirit. So do not discount him. Do not his, uh, discount him at all. He is so precious. He, I mean, this is what Jesus said when he left us. He left us. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. I, he's going up, but he, he left the Holy Spirit to help us out down here. So amen. So uh, we thank him for being our comforter. We thank God for the Holy Spirit because that is the whole package. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So let's just, hallelujah, let's just praise him today. Hallelujah. Let's praise the Lord. Let's, let's allow the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, to come on in. Come on. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, Lord. Consuming fire.
way in this room today. Have your way with your people today, Lord. Come on. Hallelujah. Have your way. Oh, Lord, open the hearts. Open the hearts of these men and women today, Lord. Hallelujah. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Have your way, Lord. Reveal, Lord. Set the truth, Lord. Hallelujah. Have your way. Have your way. Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Have your way, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. i 
David says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you and my flesh faints for you. Father, we seek you and we know that when we seek you, we find you.
touch my heart like you do. I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. There is none. can be as close to the Lord as you want to be. In John chapter 6 and verse 66, it refers to people who went to the back of the crowd. They were at a distance. But then we've just sung, I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hand, lay back against you and breathe and feel your heartbeat. There is a place that close to the Lord for us this morning. Don't you sense his presence in the room this morning? Father, thank you that uh, we have gathered in your name, and when we do, you promise you would be with us. You have not disappointed your people today. So, Lord, we declare over this hour and over today and over this week, for the people of God who need healing, this will be a week of healing for the people of God who need provision in any area of their life you will prove to be the great provider for your people this week we honor you we lift up your name in the house of the Lord today and we receive the best you have for us in Jesus name and everyone said amen well give the Lord a praise before you're seated And if you know the person sitting next to you, you can go ahead and be seated if you don't introduce yourself on your way to your seat. And we're dismissing our teenagers now. You're not a teenager. <laughs> our teenagers, we're dismissing them uh, for their service in the youth center. So good to see all of you here today. I've been... Looking forward to today since last Sunday. This is the highlight of my week. Every week, and what an honor it is to be with you today and every Sunday. Thanks for being here and those worshiping uh, virtually with us. We're grateful to have you with us as well. Our rushers are coming and giving you a chance to give in tithe and offering. And we do appreciate your faithfulness in this. I don't know of any other church in the nation, and I feel like I've been to all of them. I think I've been to every church. Uh, I used to do that full time, go to churches all over the country, uh, but I don't know of another church in the country uh, our size that has made and is making a greater impact in the world for world missions beginning here at home. We're connected to a lot of local ministries that... Uh, uh, take care of the most desperate near us, and then to the ends of the earth and planting churches and supporting pastors and missionaries all over the world. And it's because of what you have in your hand right now that you're releasing into the kingdom of God, and you have his word on it. When you do that, he always gives back much more to us than we give him. We bless the offering and we bless you as you give. Ushers, you may serve the people of God. 
just a couple of announcements before we get into the Word, and that is next Sunday is uh, the big day for uh, us fathers. It is Father's Day. How many were here on Mother's Day and enjoyed the three mothers who shared? Wasn't that most inspiring? Well, we men thought we would give it a shot. So I've asked three great fathers and faithful men in our church to take 10 minutes each next Sunday morning as we celebrate, celebrate Father's Day, and they'll be talking about faith and how faith is so important to be a good father to our children. But there's something in it for everybody, even the women. We're, uh, uh, we're going to have a great time next uh, Sunday as we hear from Reggie Canteen Sr., the father of our youth pastor, Reggie Jr., Jolly Ayabi, and Tyler Morris. Each of these dads will share a great testimony with us next Sunday morning. And bring your dad to church with you. Our dads, bring your children to church with you. Every father next Sunday will be uh, receiving a wonderful gift. It's the nicest gift we've ever given, I think, to, uh, to our fathers on Father's Day. So we celebrate Father's next Sunday. Make your plans to be here for that. And then two weeks from today, on Sunday, June 23rd, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon here at the church, Captain Darren Yarborough, who is one of our faithful men, a leading man not only in our church but in our community, uh, he is a deputy sheriff with the Florence County Sheriff's Department. I see him on the news all the time and thank God for keeping him safe uh, uh, when he leaves home every morning, as do all of our law enforcement officers. Uh, they never know what that day holds for them. So we pray Psalm 91 protection over Captain Yarborough. And also, he said, yes, we do. Go ahead, give it up for... <laughs> He also assists in leading our security and our usher team here. Uh, uh, we, we have order here. We have safety here, and uh, in large part because of uh, Captain Darren Yarborough and his uh, impartation into the men. You see, if you see a man standing around the wall with a coat on, salute them. I'll leave it like that. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, Captain Yarborough is going to be sharing a seminar. I think it's an hour long at 5 o'clock on Sunday, September, I mean, uh, June 23rd. Uh, and he's going to talk about the dangers uh, in our day, in our society, in our community, and how you can be better prepared not to be a victim. And he's going to cover all the bases. Most informative, uh, it could save a life in the future. So we encourage you to make plans to be here for that. And then finally... After the message, at the end of the service, we're calling our prayer team forward. And this will be a group of men and women who commit themselves in prayer uh, and uh, the prayer of agreement to meet needs in your life. As the word goes forth this morning, some of you will realize my faith is stronger than it was an hour ago. And you will realize you have enough faith at work to believe that the power of prayer will make a difference in your life or in the life of, of a loved one who has a need. And so we give that ministry opportunity to you at the end of our service in just a few minutes. I plan on preaching about 15 minutes, maybe 30. I don't know. It depends on how much fun we have. <laughs> okay, all right, okay, here we go. <laughs> I don't want any trouble out of you sitting over here on the front row this morning now. <laughs> oh, this is a serious subject. Uh, uh, I'm going to speak this morning on the subject face to face with God. How long has it been since you've talked with the Lord and shared with him your heart's hidden secrets. You know, it's easy even to come to church and it be a corporate gathering and you're hiding in plain sight from the Lord. You look good to all of us who are looking 
And if we get close enough to you, we'll realize how good you smell. But there's something about being alone with God that requires that we drop all the facade and all the pretense and we become nothing but real and authentic, even with our thoughts, because we know He already knows us so well. There's something about coming face to face with God, and it happened several times in scriptures. It happened uh, to uh, Joshua. It happened to Isaiah. It happened to Saul in the New Testament in the form of a blinding light. He had a face-to-face encounter with God. But today, I want to talk about the face-to-face encounter that Jacob had with God. Let me set the stage for this story, and then we'll read the Scripture. All of us look back to Abraham as being the father of our faith. God made such tremendous promises to Abraham. Against all odds, God made promises to Abraham, and then he said to Abraham, this is not just for you, but it's for your children and their children and for the generations to come. When God made that promise to Abraham, he knew we would be among an eventual generation that would need the promise God gave our father, Abraham. Now, Abraham was promised by God that he would have a son, and in fact, many descendants. But his wife, Sarah, was barren and could have no children. They continued to grow in age until... Finally, at age 100, and Sarah was 99, they gave birth to Isaac, the son of promise, the promise that God had given them. And then as we know the story, Isaac grew up, married a lady named Rebekah, and she was barren also. Notice how that the enemy tries to stop the promise of God at every generation. God had to step up and perform a miracle for Abraham to receive the promise of a son. And then in the very next generation, Isaac and Rebekah were barren. They had been married for 19 years and had not been able to conceive a child. And then finally, when she did conceive, Rebekah, Isaac's wife, had a troubled pregnancy. She would come to find out there would be twin sons in her womb. And the Bible says these twins in the womb wrestled furiously with each other. It was such a concern for Rebecca that she cried out, this mother-to-be cried out, Lord, If everything is okay, why am I like this? Now, even though some of us are men and have no idea what it's like to have a child in the womb, all of us can identify with the vexation of Rebecca's spirit when she said, why am I like this? Something's going on inside me I don't understand. We can relate to that because we have a civil war at times going on inside of us. It's the flesh versus the spirit, and it happens underneath our skin cover most of the time. And when she said, Lord, why am I like this? God spoke to her and said, there are two nations in your womb, and these two nations shall be divided. One will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Now, in the culture of that day, uh, the older one was served by the younger. But this is reversed here. Prophetically, God said the older son will serve the younger son. And when the twins were born, they were named Esau and Jacob, and Esau emerged first. But as soon as Rebekah delivered Esau, 
the firstborn of the twins, she recognized that the second son in the womb, Jacob, was holding fastly to the heels of Esau as he came out of the womb. It seems that from the moment of his birth, clenching Esau's heels as they exited the womb, Jacob's attitude was me first, me first, me first. The twin sons were complete opposites in nature and character. And Esau would grow up to be his father's son. He was rugged. He was an outdoorsman. He was a hunter. He was a man's man, and his father was proud of him. That was Esau, the firstborn. But then Jacob was the opposite. He was a mama's boy. He would help his mother cook in the kitchen. The two boys were polar opposites. Esau was rugged and hairy, and Jacob had smooth skin. One day, Esau, as an adult, came home from hunting, and he had killed nothing, and he was hungry, and his younger brother, Jacob, had spent the day in the kitchen cooking. And it was smelling good, I'm sure, in the kitchen because Esau, as hungry as he was, asked his younger brother Jacob for a, a bowl of the soup that he had just cooked. And Jacob, the one who was born saying, me first, me first, said, I will if you'll sell me your birthright. Give to me everything that should be coming to you as our father's firstborn. I want it to come to me. And, and Esau did that. And Jacob had felt cheated from birth and had always felt from birth. He had been condemned to an inferior status. So now, through deception and cunnery, he got what he wanted from birth, and that is the inheritance that should go to his brother Esau, him being the firstborn. The name of our God, the God of Israel, is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob now. It would have been the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Esau had it not been for what happened on this eventful day when Jacob the conniver conned his older twin brother out of the birthright, and now it belonged to him. But we will notice, though, even after all this, God would still keep the promise he made to our father Abraham but now the promise would have to come through Jacob and not through Esau. God's divine will always triumphs over human initiative. And then when the father Isaac was on his deathbed, and as was the custom of that day, when the patriarch of a great family like theirs was dying, he would pass on to his son, the deathbed blessings. And so Esau and Jacob and their mother Rebekah were gathered around the bed where Isaiah, the patriarch, lay dying. And Mama Rebekah was a co-conspirator in a fraudulent scheme. She wanted Jacob even in the deathbed blessing to be sure Jacob would be the one to receive the mantle. And so she said, this fraudulent mother's scheme, said to Jacob, we're going to go in and let your dad give you the deathbed blessing, but your skin is smooth. And Esau, who should have gotten the blessing, he's a hairy man. So uh, they... Uh, 
killed an animal and put the hair of an animal on his hands and on his arms. And so they go into the room for the deathbed blessing. And uh, Isaac, the dying father, when he heard Jacob speak, he said, the voice sounds like Jacob, but the hand and the arm feels like Esau. So he proceeded with the blessing from his deathbed. And now the future rested on the shoulders of Jacob, a man with flawed character. He was sly and deceptive. He was a liar and a cheater. He was a manipulator, a con artist, and he was a backstabber. He lived his life a selfish man and a self-centered narcissist. That was Jacob. And there had been such hatred between these twin brothers since the day their father died and Jacob stole the inheritance from his older twin brother Esau. Such hatred between these twin brothers that Jacob fled from his home country. And it was Jacob on the run, and he was in hiding for 20 years, afraid that if his brother would find him, it would be the death of him. Finally, Jacob reached a place of brokenness. He had run to the end of himself. He could not run any further. He finally lost all self-sufficiency. And he reached a place where he was depended completely on God now. He came to the end of himself, and he was desperate and alone. And then we read the Scriptures. We take it up there, Genesis 32, beginning at verse 24. Then Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him. Notice that the word man is capital M. Bible translators, theologians believe that this was not just an ordinary man with a lowercase m, but he was the man, the son of man. He was a form of the son of God. Some theologians think he was an angel, but the translators say, he was a capital M man. At the very least, this was a type and a shadow of the Lord Jesus. Jacob was left alone, and a man, the Lord, wrestled with him until the breaking of day. And now when he, capital H, the Lord, saw that he, capital H, the Lord, <laughs> did not prevail against Jacob, the Lord touched the socket of Jacob's hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he, capital H, the Lord, said to Jacob, Let me go, for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he, the Lord, said to Jacob, what is your name? He said, Jacob. Now, when the Lord asked Jacob, what is your name? Old Testament culture was the name of a person described their character. It wasn't because the Lord didn't know his name. The Lord knew his name. But the Lord wanted to hear Jacob say, My name is Jacob, sly, deceptive, liar, cheater, manipulator, con artist, backstabber. I'm a selfish man and I'm self-centered. That's my name. That's who I am. And he, the Lord, said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. God can redeem everything redeemable. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name. <laughs> 
I pray. And he, the Lord, said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And the Lord blessed Jacob there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, or Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Jacob, this conniving, deceptive, second-born son of Isaac, had finally come to the end of himself and was that desperate for God that he wrestled with God all night long to the point that God said, let go of me. Some of us need to get that kind of spirit working inside of us. Uh, I'm not letting go of you until you bless me. Desperation always comes before deliverance. It's a theme throughout the whole Bible. Desperation always comes before deliverance. And Jacob had been running for 20 years afraid that his brother would find him and kill him for what he had done to him. But the fear of the unknown disappears when we settle the matter with God. Jacob spent this entire night settling every issue in his life when he was face to face with God. Jacob was alone with God when the Lord showed up and the wrestling match began, lasted all night long. Jacob was still so strong and still so stubborn and prevailing over the Lord. The Lord let him do it. The Lord knew he's got to come to the complete end of himself. But it's a good sign he's not letting go of me and requiring a blessing out of me before he lets go. Have we ever been that desperate for God? And the finger of God during that wrestling match touched the socket of Jacob's hip and his hip was out of joint after that. And the Lord saying, let me go. You know, I have yet to reach the place in my wrestling with God that I've ever heard him tell me to let him go. I will not let you go unless you bless me. When the Lord asked him, what is your name? He was asking, who are you really? That's the thing about coming face to face with God. You can come in here like we are this morning, and I'm glad you're here. Uh, but it's possible to come into a corporate worship service even like this on a Sunday morning and be marked present at church worshiping the Lord, and yet the person sitting next to you or behind you may not know who you are really. But when you come face to face, with God, when you look into his face, it's like a mirror looking back at you. You see what you should be, and you see what needs to be changed in your own life in order to match the person you're looking at when you're face to face with God. So it was such an experience. It was a breakthrough for him. He would never be the same again that Jacob named that place Peniel which means I came face to face with God and lived to tell about it. Yes. That's the name of uh, the annual spring conference Margaret and Jolly uh, uh, host every year. Uh, coming up again next spring here in Florence. Peniel, I have come face to face with God. And notice the finger of God touched him in his hip and he left with a limp. When you come face to face with God and have a real encounter and get real and authentic with God and your attitude is, I'm not going to let go of this altar until you bless me, it will change the way you walk for the rest of the way you walk of your life. I have seen the face of God and I've lived to tell about. And 
I call them axioms, just life lessons that he learned and applied in his life, and he would pass on to others, including us and many others. One thing he said, I'll never forget he said it. He said, son, he, he never called me Carl. When I met Brenda, she was engaged to another man. And her daddy called me son and called her, never mind. <laughs> okay. He always called me son. Son. And he would, I remember him saying this, son, it's okay to argue with God. As long as you go into that argument, knowing you're going to lose. <laughs> so Jacob had a lot to lose, but he never let go until the Lord blessed him. It was such an unforgettable experience that he named the place, I have seen God face to face, and I've lived to tell about it. Now, a face-to-face -face meeting with God, a face-to-face -face encounter with God is always transformational. There's no way to have a face-to-face -face with God and walk away the same way you approached him. It's transformational. It's life-changing. So much so that God said, what's your name? Who are you really? Well, I'm a conniving, backstabbing deceiver. Nope, God said, nope, not anymore. I don't want to hear that anymore out of you. You're no longer Jacob, but your name is, oh my God, Israel. And God did that a few times in Scripture when he changed a person's life so dramatically that the name of the person had to be changed. He did it with Abram. Changed it to Abraham. He did it with Simon in the New Testament. Changed his name to Peter because Simon was undependable. You can't depend on him for anything. He's unreliable. He's up and down. He's unstable, inconsistent. That's Simon. But after he had a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus, the Lord said, that name's not good for you anymore. From this day forward, you will be called Peter, the solid rock. And Jesus said, the name I'm giving you, the solid rock, that's what I'm going to build my church on, and it's going to be so strong and so solid that the gates of hell can't even prevail against it. Another Instance in the New Testament where a name was changed because the life was so affected by an encounter with God was Saul on the road to Damascus to persecute and kill Christians and had that encounter with God and his name was changed from Saul to Paul. And so now there is no more Jacob alive. It's Israel now. And the limp was a reminder of the reality of the experience he had with God on this night when he wrestled with God for a blessing and refused to let God go until he got it. Now, Isaiah had a similar experience, a face-to-face -face encounter with God when he was called to be a prophet. You can read about it later. It's in Isaiah chapter 6. And it begins with this, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his glory filled the temple where I was. And he said, when I saw the Lord, my next words out of my mouth were, oh, woe is me. I'm a sinful man, a man of unclean lips. But in that encounter with God, the Lord took a hot coal off the fire and touched his lips and changed his life. Isaiah had an encounter with God and Jacob's life was changed on this night when he wrestled all night long. The Lord said to Isaiah when he 
touched his lips with the burning coal, said, your iniquity is taken away. And instantly, Isaiah realized there's a calling of God on my life to be a prophet. It happened at the same time. And God asked Isaiah in the next breath, whom shall I send? And Isaiah famously said, here am I, send me. I'm telling you, it'll put gas in your tank when you have a face-to-face encounter with God. You'll be ready to conquer the world in the will of God. Here I am, he said, send me. And then in 1 John chapter 3, toward the end of the New Testament, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, it says, Dear friends, we are already God's children. But he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. That word appears there in the Greek language literally means when Christ renders himself apparent. But we do know that we will be like him for we will see him as he really is. That's the power of a face-to-face encounter. When you see God face-to-face, when he renders himself apparent to you, you will be like him because you see him as he really is and he sees you as you really are and something happens in that face-to-face encounter with God. When he renders himself apparent. That's why when you open the book, Let it be more than words written on paper, even more than inspired words written on paper. When you open the book, your prayer and my prayer should always be, Oh, Lord, make yourself apparent to me. I'm looking in the mirror of the Word, and I don't like what I see looking back at me in this mirror. I see some things in your Word that I need to change about myself I would never have known it if I didn't see you very apparently. So that's what the Word of God does for us as His children. When we see Him, we will be like Him, a face-to-face encounter. Now, many excuses why we resist meeting with God face-to-face. Many. You may be in need of a face-to-face meeting with God today. What's your excuse? If you don't have personal revival going on in your life, it's because you're willing to live without it. Take some responsibility for a face-to-face encounter with God. You don't have to do it publicly. In fact, there is an easy compromise in that. Oh, God can show up and he does it collectively and corporately. Thank God for that. We wouldn't be here today if we didn't expect him to meet with us and he has and he is. But there's something about being along with God. Nothing you say will impress anybody listening. Remember the man in the temple, those two men who came in together and one of them was saying vain repetitions. Well, I want everybody to hear what I'm saying. I'm getting ready to tell them just how good I am. Oh, Father God. You know, you'll talk differently when it's just you and the Lord face to face. When you realize, ain't nobody looking at me. Ain't nobody hearing what I'm saying. Only God. Uh, I'm not having to get real with anybody else. I'm getting real with God, and he's getting real with me. Lord, I'm so glad I'm not like him. Oh, that sinful man right over there. Oh, yeah, I'm glad I'm better. Uh, I'm glad I'm superior to him. Well, I, I, I come to temple every day. I, I pray. I fast. I read scriptures. I can quote the five books of Moses by heart. I give tithe on everything. I'm so glad I'm not like him. Vain repetitions, caring more about what somebody else will hear or see, in you than God. Jacob was alone with God when the wrestling match began. What is your excuse? 
Jacob could have had this excuse. Oh, God, I know you want to meet with me. I know it. I know it would be life-changing. I can only imagine. But I've got to go back and make things right with my brother first. No, no, you didn't. No, that would happen later, and it was much easier. In fact, it wasn't even a deal after the face-to-face encounter with God. Uh, Oh, Lord, I've got some problems I need to straighten out. I've I've got to go clean my house. Uh, Even I've got to go bury my dead relative. Nope. Nothing takes priority over a face-to-face encounter with God. No excuses are allowed. I want to tell you the story in closing. Mark, if you will come to the piano, I I feel uh, uh, like I just want to sing in a minute. (laughs) I've heard this song all my life, and so have you. I didn't know how it was written or by whom it was written until this week. It's the story of the song, Just As I Am. It was written by a lady named Charlotte Elliott. She was born in 1789 and she lived until the age of 82. And she was healthy until she was 30 years old. Not only healthy, she was mischievous. Uh, She had quite the personality, obviously, because part of her income came from writing comedy. 200 years ago, writing comedy. She had to be a lot of fun to be around. She was raised in a godly home by Christian parents, but she went through a rebellious stage in her 20s and wanted nothing to do with it and was more interested in her own self than anything to do with God. When she was 30 years old, She was stricken with a physical disease that left her crippled for 50 years until she died at age 82. Confined to a bed for 50 years. She had become bitter against God. She was very angry with God. And she let her family know about it. While they were taking care of her in her condition. One day, after this had gone on for a while, her father invited a minister to come over to the house and pray for Charlotte. And so as the minister and Charlotte were talking, and she was telling him how bitter she was and why did God do this to me and look at me and this is not who I was, this is not what I want in life, but look at me. The minister talked to her about receiving Jesus as her Lord. And at first she would have nothing to do with it. I've heard it all my life, you know, look at me. And the minister made a statement to her and said, I see you. I see your condition. I see you just the way you are. But that's the way to come to him. You come to him just as you are. So when he left, she pondered the conversation and opened her heart for the Lord to come in. And that day she wrote the words to this song, Just As I Am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, just as I am. No excuses. You don't need to resist or plot and put God off and say, well, I've got to go straighten out some things before I can come face to face with you. No, just as She had no idea that song would be sung while millions would come to receive Jesus. Through Billy Graham's ministry alone, millions. He would always end his crusade services with that great choir in whatever city in the world he was in singing, Just As I Am. 
because that's the only way to come to him. You cannot wait until you get good enough. You'll never make it if that's your plan. You come just as you are. And that song she wrote, Just As I Am, was published in 1836 in a hymn book. She wrote all the hymns in that book. And it was called the Invalid's Hymn Book. But what a powerful truth. We come to him just am. Whatever needs you have, come just like you are. Would you stand with me, please? Miss Ruthie, if you would have your prayer team come and take their place here. There are needs among us that the Lord wants to meet this morning. But before we dismiss and you have opportunity for prayer, can we just sing this together and hello, let this be the beginning of your face-to-face -face encounter with God. Can you do it? Just as I am. Lift your voices, it's the truth. Was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I without even moving, without even taking a step from where you are, let your face-to-face -face encounter with God begin. Do it this way. Let's sing it again with your eyes closed. You know the words. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood... And that thou bidst me, thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I come. Remain with your heads bowed, your eyes closed for just one minute. Father, I thank you for the word of the Lord today. Thank you for an altar where we can meet with you. I thank you for the invitation you give us to meet with you face to face. And we tell you who we really are. And then we discover who you really are. Thank you that after an experience with God face to face, the way we walk is never the same now we honor your word and we thank you for the opportunity to pray in agreement with those who have needs in their life. And we sanctify and consecrate the altar, a place where heaven and earth connect and burdens are lifted in the house of God at this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. We're dismissing. You're free to go, but come and receive prayer for any need in your life, any burden that you're carrying. Give it to the Lord before you leave. God bless you.